Sweet. Is it that time? Should I start? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, hey everybody, welcome back. Hey. <laughs> this is the third class of the introduction of programming using Python and Pygame. Uh, yeah. Weird. Today we're going to cover. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Uh, we're going to cover functions, data structures, and input and output today. So, first things first, I'd like to review last time. We went over if statements, we went over for loops, we went over while loops, continue and breaks. Hey, Nick. Um, I just wanted to ask really quick if you guys had any questions or problems with the homework or anything like that on last week's stuff. I can pull up the presentation and run through some of those things again, if necessary. Um, just curious, it was a lot of information and it was super fast. So, any takers? Yeah, regarding this one? Yeah. Um, uh, regarding the continue and break statements, if you have nested uh, conditionals mm -hmm. or loops, where does it take you out? Cool. So continue and break statements only work in um, loops. They don't do anything when they're in a conditional. So if you have a break within an if statement, it's not going to do anything. Right. If you have a break within a loop, it's going to do something. If you have, let's say, a for loop within a for loop, it's going to break out of the first for loop and continue to be in the, in the outermost loop. Mm -hmm. That's the way that works. Uh, similarly, well, continue will only keep you in the same loop. Um, continue doesn't break you out of the loop. It just moves on to the next iteration of the loop. Cool. Any other quick questions regarding these topics? Nope? All right. Awesome. So today, as I said before, we're going to go over functions, common data structures, and input and output. Uh, for functions, we're going to talk about defining our own functions. We're going to talk about calling functions. You guys have done this already. You have made function calls. Um, so it'll look very familiar. Uh, the common data structures we're going to cover, we're going to cover the main three that are in um, Python, we're going to cover lists, tuples, and dictionaries. Um, another name for a dictionary is a hash table. Um, some of you may or may not have heard that term before. Python just likes to call it dictionaries for whatever reason. We've seen lists and tuples already within the code. I kind of gave a hand wavy explanation, but today we're actually going to cover it and see what it means to be a tuple and see what it means to be a list. And input and output, we're going to talk about how to write things to the console. So you can go ahead and like print things in your scary little window. Um, you can read things from file. We're going to talk about that as well. And we're going to talk about how to do Pygame events. So you can start adding keyboard or mouse input to whatever programs you were playing with before. Um, so let's dive right into it. Um, functions are a way to structure code. They allow new behavior for the program. Um, we've used a bunch already. Um, no big deals. We get to define them now. Um, this is uh, just some random function, um, just a, a random example function, just to show the syntax of it. Def is a keyword in Python, and it means whatever's following is a function definition. Uh, print multiple hellos, in this case, is the name of the function. Some number is an argument to the function, and an argument is just something that you pass to a function. It's a value. And uh, wherever, so if you pass the number three, wherever some number appears in the code block beneath the def call, it's going to replace some number with the number three. Um, so in this case, we're going to print hello for the number of uh, times we give to that function. And we can run this really quick if we want to. Tim, is this big enough? Look okay? I can make it bigger really quick if you'd like that. Uh, right. We always need a tab. You have to tab indent uh, functions. So the body of the function is going to be one indent more than everything else. Other languages like to use curly braces. Most other languages like to use curly braces. So folks who have learned JavaScript through Code Academy are used to seeing function definitions with uh, the curlies rather than the colon and the bunch of tabs. Um, 
So this was for n in range some number print hello. Right. So it doesn't evaluate to anything once you put it into your uh, to your Python terminal, but it will allow you to call it. So it just defines this new variable that's contained within Python, so you can use that later. It just saves that body of code, so you can repeat it easily later on. So we're going to make an add3 function. Um, you guys are going to go ahead and follow along. So I'm just going to yell out things. You guys are going to type them into your machines, and it's going to be great. <laughs> right? So the first thing, first thing we start off with is the keyword def, which I mentioned before tells Python that we're going to be making a function. So we do a def space. We add the name of the function. In this case, it's going to be add three. Um, you can spell that out if you want, or you can have a number. It doesn't really matter. The only thing you need to be aware of when defining function names is that function names cannot start with numbers. Um, yeah, that's the thing. They can start with underscores in most languages, I believe Python, you're allowed to start them with underscores, but generally special characters and numbers you cannot start functions with. Um, so we add the name of the function, add three, open parenthesis, and we put some argument there. You can call that whatever you want. And then you close parentheses, add a colon, and a new line, and you tab in, and you just use the keyword return and then whatever variable name you had plus three. And that should be your function. Should look a lot like that. Yeah? Awesome. So if you go ahead and like run that, and so now you can call add three with any number in there, and it's going to go ahead and add three to said number. Everyone's got a feel for that? Everyone see how sees how that works? What's up? Sure. What was the point of the second line, the n in range, whatever? Like, does that change what it does? We're talking about this function? Yeah. We're talking about the second line? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the for loop, right? So in order for us to print hello a number of times, we require a loop to okay. do that. So this is just, it just has the loop body in order okay. for us to print multiple times. So functions can have arbitrary code in them. It does not matter what comes after the first definition line. It can be anything. It can't be nothing, but it can be anything. It cannot be nothing. Python will err if you just try and do something like this. If you do a uh, uh, def hello, uh, right? So if we do this, it'll ask for an indentation, or it'll say that there's an indentation error. Um, the open close parentheses with nothing in between them means that this function will not take any arguments. So if I did a def hello print hel hello, the way you would call this is like that. And if you passed it an argument, it would not like that. Rachel? Didn't what didn't work? It's giving an invalid syntax What is your invalid syntax error? Uh, what did you guys type? Tell me what to type. Yeah, how did you do it? Uh, Tell me what to type. Tell me exactly what you typed. Def. Def. Space. Space. Add three already. Add three. Parentheses X. X. Colon. Did you put a, put a space in between add three and parentheses? Yes. He had that, but you shouldn't. Yeah. So that I, shouldn't I matter. That, I'll fix it. I So the space in between the parentheses and stuff should work. Really? Uh, what version of Python are you running? Even if you... All right, so again, exactly what you typed. Tell me exactly what it is. Def, space. Right. Both with a space or without a space. All right. Parenthetical x. X. Colon. You put the n paren. 
you had the end paren and everything? Yeah. All right, colon. And it tabbed it already. Yeah. And you're using, uh, you're yeah, using idle. idle. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. And then what do you have here? Return x. Oh, no, uh, yeah, return x plus three, and then I called it. It indented itself back magically, and then I called add three parentheses eleven. I took it back. I didn't. I left off the colon. See, his worked. And you got the colon and everything? Uh, maybe it's because there's spaces in between here. I'll have to check after class. I want to see what you guys did, because now I'm curious <laughs> as to what your syntax <laughs> error is. The evil IDE. Cool. So that's really it for functions. I mean, as I said before, you can have arbitrary code in a function. You can't have nothing but if you want a placeholder for whatever reason this is nice when you're like stubbing out code so when you write like a name of a function and what it should do in comments and then you don't actually want to write the code for it write this instant you can do something like def something uh, x pass and if you have the pass there it'll work fine if you don't have the pass it'll error pass means do nothing right it's just this uh, cute keyword that means do nothing Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's Python. Python tells you to use pass. Oh. That's it. Yeah, you could absolutely use a return, but they tell you to use pass. Generally, there are special cases to that. Some functions can take an infinite number of arguments, which is crazy. Um, but we're not really going to go over that. So yeah, in terms of what we're doing, yes, if you pass yeah. it the wrong number of arguments, it will break. What's up? What did that question mean? Cool. So if we have def add x, y, z, in this case, uh, return x plus y plus z. X, Y, and Z are all arguments to this function. So we're going to give this function three different numbers and have them add them together. Or in this case, you could actually use strings, but whatever, who's counting? Um, if you pass it the wrong number, so if I do an add with a one and a two, it's gonna give me an error because it says it takes exactly three arguments and two were given. And if you have four arguments, three, four, yeah, it takes exactly three arguments for given. So yeah, it will generally give you that error. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Does that answer both of your questions? Yeah? Does it care about the data types thing? So can you pass it in an array with three variables? Sure. Well, if uh, you mean if I do like an add, this is getting a little bit ahead, one, two, three, something like that? Yeah. Uh, no, but if you did this, which is like special voodoo, oh, didn't like that. Um, Totally lied. So no, the answer is no. <laughs> um, there's a way to make lists expand into arguments, but okay. we're not going to cover it. Um, you generally do it with a, a star and asterisk while you're calling the function. What's up? No, it's much more complicated than that, so I'm really not going to cover it. Uh, if you have questions about that later, just ping me. Um, so data structures allow us to store information in neat ways that we can recover the information in easy, easy ways later on. There are multiple ways that you can store data. There's multiple ways you can retrieve data. Uh, each data structure is, has its strong suits and has its weaknesses. Um, in this case, we're going to cover the three most powerful ones and a bonus one that I really enjoy. Uh, we're going to cover list tuples, mm -hmm. dictionaries, and we're also going to cover sets. Uh, sets are mathematical sets. We'll talk about those a little while later. Do you have a question? No. All right. Like <laughs> cool. So lists, we've seen before. Uh, they're a collection of elements enclosed by square brackets. Uh, they can contain anything. It does not matter. So in other programming languages, like C, for example, everything has to match. C in Java, you have to make sure, like, if you make an array of integers, uh, everything has to be an integer. In, in Python, using a list, everything 
it, yeah, it's arbitrary what you put inside of that list. Um, true, but out of scope. Um, the open close brackets next to each other just means an empty list. Um, elements can be accessed by their index starting at zero. So each one of these items within this list, so two is element zero, one is element one, bacon is element two, eggs is element three, and the empty list is element four, right? And you can access this by using uh, a square bracket and then the index of the item after that. Um, access using an index that is beyond the range of your list is going to give you an error. Using a negative index is awesome because it lets you count backwards. So right, so this would be the empty uh, empty list right here would be index negative one, eggs would be index negative two, uh, bacon would be index negative three, stuff like that. So let's go ahead and play with it. A list equals one, two, three, four, five, right? So we have a list, we can do that, we see that there's a list that exists. Um, if we do a list zero, we can get the zeroth element out of it. If we do negative one, we can get the last element out of it. If we want to see the length of a list, we can use the function len on said list, and it will tell you how many elements are within it. In this case, there are five. Um, that's basic list stuff. Mm -hmm. Not going over that. Um, so here is a few example things that you can do with, uh, with lists. These are more exciting operations. So append, when you do a.append, a being your list, will add something to the end of the list. Uh, remove will remove the first instance of the number two, I believe in this case. Len, as we said before, will uh, just give you the length of the list and index will give you the index of the first instance of the thing you pass it. That's confusing. I'm going to show you how it works and you can always do help list to see all of the functionality of a list. It'll talk about slices in there um, if you're curious as to what that means. So if we, we still have our list here and we can do a list dot append six a list just to see what's going on there. We got a six at the end now. We do a list to remove a list and it removed the number two. If we do the second it removed the number two. So the second position were zero indexed in Python, so we right. count starting from zero. So the two position would have been one in this case. Mm -hmm. So if we do a dot index of four, it's going to tell us that this is the second element in the list. Does that make sense to you guys? <coughs> so the one is the zero, three is one, and four is two. Yeah? Some of you guys look confused. And if we do help list, it's going to come up with all of this stuff. First thing it does is tell us that list is an object. Um, we're going to talk about objects next class because they're super important. Um, Wait, what did you type into that? I typed in help oh. list. Mm -hmm. And once again, to get out of the screen, you generally hit Q, I believe. We'll bring you out of it and back to the Python shell. Um, so it shows all of the methods that work on this class. I'm going to wave my hands a bunch and use words that I haven't talked about yet, but we're going to cover them next class. Um, so you can do a contains, you can do an add, you can delete items, you can do slices, you can uh, compare lists using equals greater than. Um, you can, yeah, there's so many things you can do. You can get the length, you can get a reverse list, you can is there a count. Yes, there is. There is index, insert, pop, remove, reverse, sort. So there's all sorts of crazy things you can do with a list. So, And each one of these, you can actually look for list.sort, for example. We'll give you just the documentation of that one method, as opposed to that crazy big page with all of the symbols and weirdness going on. Um, help 
is your best friend. You should always use help. Um, any questions about lists at the moment? Seem okay for now? Cool. Tuples. We've seen these before. This was another thing I waved my hands at. Uh, a tuple is a collection of elements enclosed in parentheses and separated by commas. Um, again, this can contain anything you want. It does not really matter what is contained within them. You can't have an empty tuple. That just does not work. Um, a single element in a tuple looks funny. It looks like this. So you do an open parentheses, your element, a comma, and then a closed parentheses. You have to have the comma or it does not know it's a tuple. It's just something the way it works. Uh, you can't index outside of the tuple, just like with a list. So if you try and like get something from beyond what is actually contained within the tuple, it will break. Um, they look pretty much exactly like lists, except for the parentheses. But you can't modify the contents of a tuple. Right? So if we have more examples. Uh, a tuple, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, right? So we have a tuple. And we can index this the same as we did before, right? Um, we can also get the length of it. It's five again. But if we try and do, so if we, with a list, we can modify the We can modify the contents of a list on the fly, and it doesn't really mind. So if we do something like the zeroth element in this list is now equal to hello. If we do that, and we do a list, you can see that hello has replaced the value 1 within this list. right? Now if we try and do something similar with a tuple, um, 0 equals hello, you get in there. It just does not allow you to assign anything to this tuple. What's up? Why when you're using strings, are you sometimes using double quotes and sometimes double quotes? Because I'm bad at choosing one or the other. It does not matter as long as they match on either side. So I can do hello, right? Um, I can do hello, and those are fine. You could even do. Or those return it, so it's always going to return it not just a single quote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Python, Python style says that you should use single quotes, which is fine. But it's pretty arbitrary. Is that the same in JavaScript? Hmm? You can't use triple quotes in JavaScript. You can use single quotes. You can use single quotes or double quotes. Yep, both of those will work in JavaScript. Okay. I was going to ask, well, then how do you Oh, if you want to do that. So if you want to do single quote, you can either use a double quote. So you can do double quote, hello, quote, double, right? Which will give you the quoted hello. Uh, because the outermost ones are the only ones that define the string. So anything that's inside don't matter. And if you wanted to use the same variety, you would escape it with a backslash. Hello, backslash, and then one of these, right? Which will give you the same thing. Mm -hmm. Help or hurt? Does that help or make things worse? <laughs> What's up, Ed? Why would you use a tuple instead of a list? That's an awesome question. Um, sometimes you don't want things to play with your data, right? So you want to return this value, and you don't want anyone to be able to change it through the rest of your code, right? And you would do this for, you know, let's come up with a contrived example where you have some like user identification number for your website. And you don't want code to reset that number ever, but you want to be able to use it and some of the other items. So you want like the name and the ID number, and you want to be able to pass that around, but you don't want people to manipulate that data. You would use a tuple in that case so people couldn't touch it. Right? Any other code that's going on in the system will not be able to reassign those values, so it won't be able to break inside of whatever tuple you have. Does that answer your question? All right. What's up? Because you can't in Python. Um, if we do a help tuple, right, we can go in here and we can see the methods that are available for a tuple. Um, we can see that this one only has two real functions, 
none of this like these are called dunder methods they're special for python they allow you to use um, cool things like multiplication so if you do an rmul if you define that function for a class it'll let you do multiplication with that class uh, we probably won't cover that you don't really need to know it so there are two um, normal methods that are associated with the tuple class. There's count and index. So you cannot pop and you cannot shift a tuple. Um, question, one more question. Just one more question about what? Quotes. Sure. Just to clear, so either double or single quotes in, uh, interpret the same character. What? Backslash. Can you rephrase that question, please? Like in both double quotes and single quotes, you can use like backslash. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we want to do like this sort of thing, yeah, absolutely. We can do this. Pretend I don't have typos. We can, yeah, we could even do that if we wanted, right? Um, Let me that again. Does double and single quotes change interpolation at all? Is it like in No, it is not. It is not. Yeah, yeah it does not change any evaluation. Um, Any other questions about quotes or tuples or lists? Anyone? Cool. So the next data type we're going to cover are dictionaries. These are probably my favorite, and they are super useful. Uh, a dictionary is a collection of key value pairs enclosed in curly braces. Uh, keys and values can be of any type. That's wrong. Values can be of any type. Keys must be strings. Uh, keys cannot be modified, but values can. And values are accessed through their key. Right? So if we do a, a dict equals curly brace a 1, and we put a comma, b 2, comma, c Three, right? Close that up. Do a dict. Right, we have that. To index these, we would use the keys. Um, if we use, just try and use an index, it's going to give you a key error because zero is not contained within that dictionary. Um, just to make sure I'm not a liar, I want to check to see if I can do this uh, something. Hey, it worked. Who knew? Um, cool. So you notice one thing here. It reordered everything. Um, it does that automatically through some algorithm it has behind the scenes in order to store this data. So when you have a hash table, when you have a dictionary, um, your, the order in which you get things out of it is never guaranteed. Right? So you'd have to use something that is sortable. A hash table or a dictionary is not sortable. Um, but yeah, it looks like keys and, I guess I was right on the slides, keys and values can be anything. Um, if we do help dict here, we can see a bunch of different functions that are available to hash tables. We can clear, we can copy, we can get a new dictionary from the keys, which is kind of cool. We can get, um, we can check to see if it has the key, we can get all of the items in key value pairs form. We can iterate over the items, iterate over the keys, stuff like that. So if we wanted to use a dictionary in a for loop, we could go for k in a dict dot keys print k. And that will print all of the keys that are contained within your dictionary. If you do the same for values, It'll print all of the values for the keys. Uh, the order in which it will print the values is uh, dependent on the order in which Python decides your keys should go. And how is that defined? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Behind the scenes, there's a, uh, a data structure called a red-black tree. I believe this is true. 
Um, so it's implemented with another algorithm behind the scenes in order to do this. So it uses a hashing algorithm from a different, like some underlying data store from which it exposes this dictionary to you. So there's like a lot more going on underneath the hood than just like these curly braces. There's like a lot of math going on behind the scenes. Um, hand wavy answer. You can read about the implementation online. It'll definitely tell you exactly how it's implemented. Um, yeah. Any questions on dictionaries? You have a dictionary, dictionary? Yeah, you can have a dictionary of a dictionary. So you could do something like uh, a dict equals a, and then you could, yeah, b or one, yeah, whatever. Uh, true. This is absolutely contrived, but yes. uh, seven false, right? We can do this. It doesn't really care. So if we do a dict a, it's going to return to us another dictionary, in which case we can chain these things together to do all sorts of nonsense to get true back, right? So we can go arbitrarily deep, um, provided our data structure allows that with our indexing. Same with, same with, the same with lists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One, two, three. Uh, four, five, six, right? We can do something like this. Uh, a list equals, and we do a list, negative one. We have that, and we can do one out of that. We can still, yeah. Yep, absolutely. What's up? Um, because we're specifying, so whenever you access, you use a dictionary to store key value stores, which means that you are only going to be using the key in order to get the values. That's basically the way you always use dictionaries. That makes sense to you? Yeah. All right, cool. Just making sure you're good. Um, any other questions? You can do this with tuples as well. I'm not going to do it again, because whatever. But take my word for it. It works with tuples as well. And you can show methods and functions there. Yeah, sure. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about input and output. Um, we call this I.O. in computer speak. And I.O. is the way you interact with your users. Uh, the main two modes of input and output are files and to the shell, to your Python shell. Um, Print function, functions will print data to the shell. Uh, and raw input, the function, will get information back from the shell. This, is, this part right here is super Python specific, as were the data structures. Like This stuff varies wildly from language to language. Um, but yeah. So if we do something like this, you do some number equals raw input, give me your number. It's going to prompt you with the prompt, give me your number. And then going to set some number to be whatever number you typed in. Um, some number will come in as a string. Let's just do it. Right? So we got some number equals raw input uh, some number. Right, we can do this. It gives you a custom prompt saying some number, question mark. We can just type in whatever we want, one, two, three in this case. And if we look at some number, the variable we assign this to, we see that it's the string one, two, three. Right? So whenever you use raw input, it's always going to return to you a string. Right here, we can see. It reads a string from standard input. Trailing new lines are stripped. Um, yeah. Yep. So if we wanted to take this number and actually make it into a number, we could use the call int to do that. It's just a function that will take a string and turn it into an integer. Uh, we could even turn it into a float if we wanted to, which takes a string and turns it into a floating point number. Any questions on raw input? How that works, why that works? Any gotchas there? Is, it, is there a similar method 
for receiving input from a serial line? Yeah, there definitely is. Um, we generally use a bonus library here at HackDC called uh, PySerial in order to do that. Um, I might talk about that next class if you want to show up for that. Um, but yeah, that's, it's a cool way to do it and it's super easy because you just do like serial.write or serial.read and it will just give you information right over the line. You just construct a serial object, you give it the device handle and then you just go from there. Mm -hmm. No. All right, so file IO is when you read or write to a function, or to a file. Um, to first, to read or write to a file, you require, you have to open the file first, so your, your operating system needs to know that Python is asking for a file to use. Um, you would use, uh, to read over a file, you'd use a for loop on the open file. So you could do for line in and then the open file name. Uh, to write to a file, you use a write function, and when you're done with the file, you can use a close function. Um, there's a special statement called with. I've never seen it used except for in this context. Um, it makes reading and writing to files super easy. So here's an example. You can open the file test.txt with this call. So the first argument to this function is the file name. The second argument to this function is the mode in which you are opening this file. In this case, it is uh, the mode in this case is write, write only, because that's the only thing there. You can use uh, R, W, um, I think those are the only two, there might be one more. Um, there's a B as well for binary data versus not binary data. Um, you'll never really have to worry about that, so just go with W and R. So you do an f.write hello world, f.close, and then you have a new text file with the word hello world in it. Um, then you can use the with statement to open the file as read, and then you can go through it that way. So we do a f equals open uh, test.txt as write. We do f.write. Hey there, f dot close. Oops, gotta add the parens. Um, if we look in, I am in class two in the code directory. I now have this file, right? And this file contains, hey there, just like we wrote on the command line, super cool. So we can use the with statement with F as, whoops, what was it? With open as F2, right? I always forget that. With open test.txt R as F for line in F print line. That will print every line that's contained within that file. So with this with statement, you notice how I omitted the close? The with auto automatically handles that for you. So you don't need, really need to think about that anymore. It'll just kind of automatically do that for you. So with term, uh, the, the, like F2 or F is a normal variable? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, it is. With is opening the file and creating a variable called f. Within that variable, it is storing the file handle. Right? The opened file is stored within f. It then executes the body of the width code. In this case, it's the for loop for each line we print. And then once all of that is over, it closes the file. Once you're out of the block, it closes the file. Yep, that's exactly what happens. Yeah, absolutely. And if you had, yeah, as soon as it came to the end of the block, it would just close that function, or that file. Which internal methods does it use? Which what? Internal methods does it use? Like uh, you have the internal code method for elevation? I don't know what internal methods it uses. Okay. I think it just uses uh, just the close. It has some, there's some like context stuff going on behind the scenes. So like the file object within Python 
has some data members that specify a context in which it is defined, and yeah, so it does all sorts of crazy stuff. Okay. Help with. Nope, doesn't work. Hmm? Do I use the with statement in code? Yes, I do, for file reads. Yeah, it's a beautiful statement. Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, there should be. So if we do help open, right. So we have this mode. Um, see, file doc. That's not very helpful. I think there's an A for append. Okay. That'll work for you. Uh, so it should be W, R, A, and you can add a B to the end of that to specify whether or not it's binary. Right, yeah. Yep. So if we do f equals, then we do f dot write. Hey, again. F dot close. And then we go ahead and look in this directory. It doesn't, it didn't give me a new line because I never typed that in there, but it did append to the end of that file. So A does work for appending. Thanks for that question. So it, it doesn't put in the new line automatically? It does not put in the new line automatically. Mm-hmm. Yep. Any other questions there? Blitzkrieg of file IO? No? Nothing? All right, cool. So we're going to talk about Pygame events. We're going to go over some sample code, and then I'll hang out for a little while. So in case you guys have questions. Does not. Um, so events in Pygame. Oh, I'm sorry. What's up? Um, if there were several lines in this file and you told it to print line, would it give you all of them? What does uh, line mean? What does line mean in this for loop? Yes. Uh, so right up here we have this for loop for line and f, right? Mm -hmm. So what it's going to do, it's going to loop over every a uh, new line in the file. So it's going to start with the first line there, and it's going to give you the value of whatever's in that first line, line until it hits a line return. Okay. right? <coughs> and then you can do whatever you want with it. In this case, we're just printing it. It'll move on to the next line and hand that off to you in the variable line. Okay, so Does like that make sense? Exactly. Line is a variable, and it, it's just like this, this counter variable, basically, for whatever line you're on within the file itself. So it prints the file in some way as well? Yes. Exactly. It treats it much the same as it would like a list of a bunch of different strings. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No? All right. Cool. So in Pygame, we have events. Um, events are another form of I.O. You have to deal with them a little bit differently within Pygame. Um, it's neat because they represent keyboard presses, mouse movements and presses, uh, joystick presses or axis moves or whatever. <coughs> um, events have types that specify what they are, so you can see whether or not it's a keyboard or a mouse or a joystick press. Um, and then, so to get events out of the thing, you'd use pygame.event.get, and that will return you a list of all of the events that are going on, and then you loop over those events to handle them and actually do some, something interesting with them. Um, so, for example, uh, we have this this call to pygame event dot get, and that's going to go ahead and get you all of the events in a list and return it to you. And we store that in the variable events. Um, we loop over that variable events, um, storing the line that we're on in E. So we can now see like if E is of the type quit. So if you hit that little X mark, remember how that never worked on anyone's thing? And I told you it was sloppy coding because we didn't include events on how to do that. So when you click the X mark, it shoots an event to Pygame, and it's uh, an event of type quit. So then you just return out and just like continue along your way. Um, you can check for key down events. 
you can check the type of key that's being pressed. So e.key will like let you see what key was being pressed at the time. And yeah, that's what's going on there. I have this in sample code so we can actually see what's going on. Um, so any questions so far about anything in Python, anything at all that I can help you guys with at the moment? What's up? This pygame.vet.get, you have to do all of the other pygame stuff first to like yes. open it. Okay. Yeah, you got to do the magic three lines in order for that to work. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so when you hit four D in events, if yeah, there's a list of events that have happened at that point? Or that have, so the way that works is it stores a list of events until you check with get. So it'll basically be like you make one get call, it clears everything, right? So but it hands you the results. And then whenever you start doing things, it'll start stacking them up until you call get again, and then it will return you that whole bunch and clear it again. It's exactly like a queue. Any other questions at the moment? Is there some way to get just the last event? Uh, you could do events uh, negative one, like you would with a, a list or something like that. I think you can do that. I don't know how to do it off the top of my head, so I would have to check the documentation for it. But every, every time you uh, call this event, the event's not there, it, it clears it. Yep. Yep. So the homework for this class, I'm just going to mention it really quick, um, is to add some interactivity to whatever you drew before. So if you got around to making an animation, go ahead and try and add like keyboard or mouse events to it, because it's funsies. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, originally, I taught this class using GitHub as well, so you guys would learn how to store your code online and how to use a version repository system. I skipped that this class because it was super complicated and it really didn't help at all. Um, so you can, you should use GitHub because it's great, <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you how to do it. <laughs> um, again, we have an email list, so please send your issues, your suggestions, whatever else is going on. Um, yeah, cool, to sample code. Uh, all right, so I've got three sample, right, I've got three different uh, example code snippets that I want to go through today. The first one is events example. So right here you can see that it's showing us what events are being created. So these are mouse move events, these are keyboard events. Right? So you see key up versus key down. If I hold a key down, it doesn't repeat key down, it only does it once. Um, stuff like that. Right. So if we look in here, we can actually see that um, this mouse motion event has a dictionary within it, right? Those should look similar, or those should look familiar now. It's got buttons, which says whether or not each one of these buttons is depressed. This is a left, middle, right mouse click. The position, which is a tuple, right? Of the position, the XY position of your mouse cursor. And rel, I'm not sure what that means, but I assume it's relative to the last mouse move, I would guess. Um, if we, oh man. Stop that. Probably quadrant. What's up? Is it one through four, it looks like? Is it one through four? Yeah. Uh, is what one through four? The rel. Oh, yeah. The what? Oh, the rel? No, it's like negative 17, negative 7 in this case, right? So there's a line wrap here because I made my text a lot bigger, but that is uh, negative 17, comma negative 7. Um, so if we scroll up and check out these key up events, we have a scan code, which is the, it's the number of the button you pressed on your keyboard. Each keyboard is associated with a number. Um, the key is also associated with a number, but that has a nice shiny label to it. Um, so you can use like K underscore A, like we did in the events example in the code before, and that'll show you what's going on. And mod tells you whether or not you have modifiers, like shift or control or alt being held while you press it. 
Um, so let's take a peek at this code, see what's going on. Uh, vim events example, right? Pardon all the line wraps, just wanted to get the code bigger. Um, so if we, wow, that's really short. So we look at the top here, we have our import sys, which is a library. We're going to talk about common libraries next class. Um, so that's going to be a little hand wavy bit for now. And pygame, we import pygame just like we did before. We do a pygame.init. Um, we set the size, which is going to be equal to width, comma height, which is going to be equal to 500, comma 600. So basically what that says is size is a tuple, right? And that tuple, uh, within that tuple, width and height are contained. And width and height are equal to 500, 600, right? Does that make sense? I kind of chained that in a funny way. So this is equal to, um, so if we did, Uh, can width and height be changed? Yeah, but the change will not be reflected within size. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this one line right here, oop, this is equal to the, and this is equivalent to the two lines underneath it. So it's first setting width and height equal to 500, 600, and then it is setting the size equal to width and height. Hmm? Parentheses optional. Parentheses optional. Uh, we make the color black as a tuple, right? So one thing I didn't mention before, um, parentheses are entirely optional with tuples. As long as you have commas there, that's fine. It really reads the commas and it doesn't read the parentheses. The parentheses are just a nice way of denoting it because it looks easier to see. Um, we create our screen like we did before. We set a caption to the screen just for giggles. And we have our loop. So while one just means go on forever. It's an infinite loop. This will never break. Um, we do a for event in pygame.events.get. So what this is going to do is, again, it's going to return us all of the events um, one at a time. An event, the variable, is going to be assigned to each one of those events. We're going to print that event. And if the event type is pygame.quit, we're going to exit this program. And then we're going to continue to keep the screen black, just for giggles. Right. So the neat thing about this one is now we can click this little X button, and it actually does something. So it won't give you the spinny beach ball of death. You can actually click it, and it will not freeze your computer. Hooray! Um, yeah, you can even see there's an event, uh, a quit type event. It'll print it before it actually exits. Um, Any questions on this little bit of code right here? What's up? Um, how does, uh, with the tuple, you, you don't have to, you can just put a, use, like how does it know that that's a tuple, I guess? The black, sorry, black equals zero, uh, zero, zero. How does it know that that's a tuple? Yeah. The commas. That's it. That's it. So when it sees commas, it's like, oh, this must be a tuple. Okay. Right? So when it sees a trailing comma, I guess, so you can have anything. Absolutely. Yeah, so if we do a equals one comma, right? right. A is the tuple, okay. one. Mm -hmm. Yep, you can do that. But it in that piece of code, there was no trailing comma. Like, was right, absolutely true. Yeah, you, we could have. So we could have done like an a is equal to zero, 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 comma, right? But it doesn't have to have It's equivalent. It does not have to have the trailing comma, but it can have the trailing comma, okay. and it does not have to have the parentheses. Yep. Yeah. So every time it goes through the loop, it sees four events. If I get that event, I get it. Then if nothing's happened, it just skips nothing. Exactly. It just keeps running by the chip. Mm hmm. Yep. So if there's nothing new in the events, it's going to skip over this for loop and it's going to like keep the screen black and then it's going to go back to the top of the while loop until it has something to do with the, uh, with the actual events. Yes, there is. It's called polling out of scope. Any other questions for this code? Cool. We have paddle control as well. Love paddle control. Python, paddle control, right? 
So we got this bouncing ball thing again. Oh, that's weird. Probably shouldn't do that. Um, I can move the paddle now, which is pretty cool. Your screen or is it just going What's up? Oh man, didn't even notice that. Better? Yeah, so we can do this. If we try really hard, we can actually trap the ball underneath the paddle. Um, so as you'll notice here, the physics are really dull. Yeah, this makes for a really shitty game of Pong. Um, so you're actually going to have to like fudge some of the numbers in there to actually like to get it bounce in different directions depending on where it hits the paddle, stuff like that. We're going to cover that more. But right now, I just want you guys to see that I'm like moving this paddle around with my up and down arrows on my keyboard, and it's actually reflecting that on the screen, and the ball is behaving uh, accordingly. I think I can click that, and it works. Clear. Vim paddle control. All right. Cool. So the first thing we do here is we do our import statements. We got uh, import pygame and from pygame.locals.import star. This was two of the three lines of the special incantation you need to get pygame working. Uh, then we define some global variables. Um, there's no difference between these normal variables other than the fact that I made them all caps and I'm going to use them throughout my code. Um, the all caps is just to let me know that they exist everywhere. Um, pygame.init, we can do that call so we can go ahead and get things running. We create a clock again so we have a, a good frame rate going. We create our screen and give it a name. All of this should look relatively familiar. This is basically the formula for creating a window. We create a background surface, we fill it with black. And now we have a bunch of functions because this is the function class. We have a uh, we have a function to draw the paddle, which uh, takes a uh, paddle as an argument, and it goes ahead and draws a rectangle uh, in the color blue um, to the screen. Draw ball does something similar. It takes a uh, it takes a x y position, and it will draw the ball at a given x y position, um, and it will make it green. We have update paddle, so we have this uh, direction. So we pass it both the paddle, which is the uh, uh, x, y, and the width and the height of the paddle. We pass that as well as the direction to the update paddle function. And we go ahead and, yeah. So we check to see whether or not the direction is up or down. And then we move the paddle accordingly. So you can see here that we're just uh, subtracting 10 because our zero, 0 starts in the upper left-hand corner of our screen. So when we want to move up, we're actually going negative. And when we want to move down, we're going positive. Right? So if we're going up, we're subtracting 10 from the value. We're moving it 10 pixels up. And if we want to go down, we're adding 10 pixels to it. So the little, uh, the little paddle will go 10 pixels down. Mm-hmm. Yep. You got it. Um, we have this update ball function, which takes the ball and the speed at which the ball should be moving, and it updates the ball accordingly. Um, we have this check collision function, which does all the fancy math to see whether or not we're colliding with the wall or with the paddle. Um, so just really quick, this is checking to see the ball's x position minus 10, so that's like the edge of the ball, is less than or equal to uh, the edge of the paddle, right? So that's this first part. Then we have the same for if the ball is uh, further past the paddle, so if it's greater than the paddle, yeah, so if it's hitting the other end of the paddle, it'll bounce or Probably. Um, and this is the ball less than paddle paddle three. Paddle three would be the width. Yeah, so all this is just doing the collision math for it. I encourage you guys to play with it, as I'm going to do later, to see what these numbers actually mean. Um, it didn't. So right in here, we have our game loop defined as a function. Um, this function takes no arguments, as you can see right here. Um, we create our paddle, so it's 20, uh, the x position is 20, 
the Y position is the middle of the screen. Uh, the width and the height are 20 and 100 respectively. The ball starts in the middle of the screen and the ball speed is 10. Um, and then we have our while loop to check for events. So we print the event type and if the event type is quit, then we return. Um, if the event type is key down and the event's key is uh, 273, which is up, then we move up. We call uh, update paddle up. Or if it's moved down, then we do something similar. Right? So every event has a dictionary associated with it. So we can do event.dict and it will give us the dictionary that's contained within the event and then we can access whatever's within it with the keys that, it was, that was there before. So if we look, I cleared my screen so it's not going to be there. Oh cool, we still got some. So this is the dictionary that I'm talking about and this is for mouse events. So each one of the keys, we have buttons, we have position and we have rel. So we can access each one of those by indexing using the square brackets and the key name. All right. the amount of pixels the ball is going to be moving okay. in the x direction per frame. Per frame, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So then we go ahead and we click the clock, we black the screen, we draw the paddle, and we draw the ball. We go ahead and update the ball's position, we check to see whether or not the ball has collided with anything, and then we go ahead and display what's going on. This little fanciness at the bottom, if name equals main, and then game loop, allows us to call this as a script as opposed to uh, using Python. So we can do Python like this, uh, paddle control, or we can do something like this in theory, right? Doesn't really matter. You don't really need that. As long as you have the game loop at the bottom, it's going to work. Um, the, you'll see that a lot in Python code, the if name equals main just because like, people write scripts like this. It's just very commonplace. So we wanted to show you guys what that actually looked like. Um, any questions about this code right now? Sorry, I can't fit it all on the screen at once. Um, Shoot. Yeah, so if you, if you write a pi file that's full of um, pi functions, mm -hmm. you call those functions from the pi file? Mm-hmm. As long as your um, Python file has an import statement. So import takes a, a Python file name without the extension, and it will expose all of the functions that you have defined within that file to the function that, or the file that you're presently working in, if that makes sense. And as far as like, um, sort of, like say you wanted to create two paddles, um, but only use that code once, right? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Uh, right now, this code right here would work for that. So. Uh, we look, if we look at the update paddle, for example, we pass it a paddle, and that's a tuple of four things that represents a rectangle. So we could pass that any tuple we want, and this update function would work properly. Yep. So we tried to build this in a generic way where um, you, we use functions to call things. So we could have multiple paddles, and we could have multiple balls, or we could have whatever we want, just because we're repeating the same code. That's the beauty of a function right there. Um, for modules, for your previous question, we're going to be talking about that next class or the class after, I believe. Any other questions about this code? I have one more piece of sample code before I let you all go. Cool. Let's get to it. Pong paddle new. Well, let's run it first. Let's see what's going on. Neat. It's the same shit as before. <laughs> Hooray. Can't even control it. That's wonderful. So, and you can't hit the X. I should have fixed that. All right. Uh, Vim, what am I doing? Uh, right. Cool. So, the biggest difference between this code and last week's code is the use of functions. We've started to encapsulate some of the logic for the, Pi, uh, the Pong game within a bunch of functions. So it's going to look pretty much exactly the same. The code is going to be like hella similar to the code from last class, 
but everything's going to be encapsulated in functions now, so we have like good code reuse, and we can actually like see what each one of these functions is doing, and it's nice and blocked out. Um, next class, we'll be adding classes to that. We'll be adding objects, so we'll have like a paddle object, which will be really cool. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to leave this one up as an exercise. You guys can go read through it and see the difference between last week's class code and this week's class code, and you can see what's going on there. Um, but other than that, I'm about done. I'll be here for around another hour, just hanging out for your questions. And uh, yeah, have a good night.